Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. It is the last episode of this season, and we're so excited to have you back. I'm Maya Todale. I'm an autistic psychologist from Denmark, and this is Give Dara Diamond. Diamond. <laughs> and I'm an autistic teacher from Canada. So today we're going to be talking about autistic joy and autistic victories. And uh, we've so been looking forward to recording this episode because it's it's such a under exposed topic, I think. And like, definitely you, a great way to wrap up our 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 first season. And our that's what we were thinking. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like this is this is a good way to kind of okay. That was this season and then we'll we'll move on and by the end of of this episode we're going to talk a little bit about our plans and hopes for the next season so i really hope you stick with us let's get started Welcome to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. Candid conversations between autistic off-hour professionals. <laughs> Trigger warnings for this episode include um, a few cursey words, not very many, um, and some discussion of ableism and mentions of comorbid diagnoses such as depression, anxiety, etc. Um, nothing in depth as we're focusing on joy and victories today, but um, they are mentioned, so do be aware of that. We wanted to do thing of the day right off the bat today because I found a really fascinating article. I'm a research nerd. You probably all know this by now if you've listened to our other episodes, but it is an article called Neurodiversity, Epistemic Injustice and the Good Human Life by Robert Chapman and Javi Carell. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and the idea of this article is that epistemic injustice limits our capacity to recognize, understand, and cultivate autistic thriving and well-being. And there's sort of a, a catch-22. So they describe the injustice as, as sort of two subtypes, testimonial injustice, which is the idea that due to the stereotypes um, surrounding narratives around autism, uh, our credibility is significantly undermined. So we're seen as unreliable narrators, uh, poor interpreters of social situations. We don't understand social situations. Our perceptions are off in some way. And, and tied to this idea is that autism is only recognized when we are perceived to be suffering. And there's actually a great section in this article about ways media has traditionally framed autism, you know, kidnapped child, combating, fighting autism, some, some of the very loaded mm -hmm. negative language. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is um, hermeneutical injustice, which is basically just the idea that uh, we have constructed ideals of human flourishing in a very neurotypical way, which excludes yeah. divergent modes of flourishing. So, mm -hmm. so the overall idea is that the way autism is seen in society poses autism on one side and happiness on the other. They're at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. So if we appear to thrive or be happy, uh, we either are not autistic. So even if we're like, I'm autistic and I'm happy and doing all right, we are not believed. <laughs> or uh, it's seen as a very subjective experience, but objectively, we can't possibly be happy because uh, you like, know, like you can't possibly know better. Like if you feel like you're happy, you're it missing must be something. Because, yeah, you, you you don't know what real happiness is. Like, and and the way that autism mm -hmm. is always sort of blamed for the challenge rather than anyone looking at the systemic barriers, societal mm -hmm. perceptions and expectations, ways we are traditionally excluded, marginalized, mm -hmm. and all of those things. So this article really calls on broadening our conceptions of what a good life is because if we accept the neurodiversity paradigm it follows that there are many different valid ways of flourishing and thriving yeah. and functioning in general and they have a four-step um, way to accomplish this 
the first of which is dismantling the medical deficit approach to autism. Uh, then relativize, relativizing value judgments about character and behaviors of autistic mm -hmm. persons. But I would also say like relativizing what a good life means. I think yeah. I don't think there can objectively ever be one definition of a good life. No. Uh, <laughs> cultivating autistic self-understanding and fostering neurotypical epistemic humility and cross-cultural communication. Oh, I love that. It was such a great that. article. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing that really catches me is um, is the point about how autism is always kind of blamed for any unhappiness or any um, barriers in life. Um, whereas what I see very often, um, both with myself, quite honestly, but also with so many of my clients, is that very often the big issue is anxiety or depression. Yes, which comes from, uh, you know, which comes from like social an exclusion and and like the constant barrage of of expectations that don't fit and our... the lack of supports, you know, and yeah. And that's not to say that there are not other things about uh, being autistic that are hard. There certainly are, mm -hmm, of course. That, even if if we felt welcomed with open arms, like I still think the world that we live in today, the sensory uh, overload, cognitive overload, there there are certainly some real significant challenges yeah. above and beyond just social acceptance. But social acceptance, social lack of social acceptance contributes so much, like you said, to anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. suicidal ideation, suicide, exactly. completely, like in our community. Yeah. So the first thing is like, okay, when we are unhappy, it's usually because our needs aren't met, which isn't that just human? I mean, for, for me, it's kind of like, if any person's needs aren't met, they're going to be unhappy. That's very logical. Yes, I agree with you. That That's, that's not an autistic thing. It's just that our needs are a little bit different. So that's and kind we of the live first in a world thing. that isn't built around. Yeah, our exactly. Needs, built around exactly. what is easier for you know so-called neurotypicals. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing I really love about that article is is really highlighting the idea that um, that autism and happiness are seen as opposites and. Like you said, if if you profess to be autistic and happy, people view you as either not autistic yeah. or you just don't really know what you're talking about. Exactly. Like, like the credibility. Like it's, it's, it's a lesser kind of happiness. Yes. You can't possibly know what a fulfilling life is. If mm -hmm. you're autistic, um, yeah. and, and oh, it, that was sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> you need to see my face, but uh, yeah. the article also makes it really clear that you know it's really it makes it impossible for autistics to also know what is possible mm -hmm. for a good life for them when they don't see uh, mm -hmm. ways of flourishing when the narrative is so so depressing. Yeah. And centered on yeah. our distress and our difficulties with functioning. Not to say yeah. those don't exist, they do, but yeah. you know, we we need to have representations of of autistic joy. I know we you and I talk about this a we lot. We do. We do. It's and it's it's actually something that Kara and I talk a lot outside of the stuff we record. <laughs> Very often we'll start having some discussion and afterwards we'll go, we should have recorded that. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> um, but be, we very often talk about how there are all these stories out there of autistic people really getting somewhere with their own life that they are happy about and where they feel fulfilled or they've accomplished something that they're proud of. And we talk amongst each other about it and kind of celebrate each other yeah. as a community. Um, and I, I, I feel like there are definitely segments of our community that are very good at uplifting each other. Mm -hmm. But if you look at 
kind of mainstream media representations, it's always a little. Um, well, you you have you have the stereo stereotypes. So not to say that there aren't people who are autistic and fit the stereotypes. They come, but it's also a little bit reason. patronizing sometimes. It's like, oh, look at this autistic person. They've learned to make these little figurines or something. Isn't that wonderful? Or it's the autistic tech genius or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. I had a student I just loved who would talk about this all the time. She was 12 years old and she would say things like, why can't mm-hmm. they just let us be mediocre? <laughs> and I was like, yes, point, you know, because, um, well, even just the idea of what is success, what is fulfillment? Like, I think we have it all wrong when we think it has to be a job. It has to be marriage. It has to be, you know, Mm -hmm. all of those things. It's different for every person. My brother, Danny, I think has one of the best qualities of life, uh, like objectively and subjectively think is like viewed from both ways. He's incredibly happy. He's Mm -hmm. well supported. His needs are met. He does not have a full-time job. He does not have a so-called romantic relationship, but he spends every day, doing things that he's interested in doing, a variety of activities. He goes to a, a program and, and learns lots of new things. And yeah. he's like one of the happiest, most uplifting people I know to be around. Oh, that sounds so amazing. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I think when we think we have to fit into neurotypical boxes, that yeah. erodes um possibilities for happiness like we really have to focus and I think neurodivergent affirming therapy needs to focus on what is fulfillment for you as an autistic individual yeah and this is actually something that um that I do both in energy accounting but also that um Peter Vermeulen focuses on in in his happy program can we get him as a guest Peter oh my god I really I really hope so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. List. That's my, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but we, we talked about it. Um, we, we met in Spain earlier this year. Oh my God, my sense of time. Um, but we talked about how like, it's, it's so important that we start talking about and start focusing on what is the individual's um, needs and what will make them happy, not, you know, what does society deem a good life? Yeah. It's, well, it's so I see it restricting. As a, I see it as a two-pronged approach because, you know, mm. rugged individualism is, is a problem in society in general, but you, you do always have to approach these things in two ways. Yes, we want the greater societal change, which takes a collective approach, which requires education, media awareness, all of these things. Mm-hmm. We, but there is still individual, um, an individual component. Like I, I always hate things where we go, all right, just do a little mindfulness and that, that'll that solve all your problems because it's not a panacea for the injustice, the systemic no. barriers that people face. And, and, you know, if we're talking from like an intersectional lens, you and I face cons- like less barriers than many of our autistic um, Definitely. community members. But individual component is still important in like, what finding what makes you happy as an individual um Mm. trying what we can do to survive in this this chaotic sometimes depressing always confusing world Um, yeah but but going further than that because i feel like of course the the first step um it's almost a little bit maslow um his pyramid uh you know it's it's like, okay, first survival, but what, we, what we're what we trying to look at is how do we move beyond just surviving in this world? How do we actually create an environment around each person that takes their needs into account mm-hmm. and helps them to thrive? Mm-hmm. And I, I think... <laughs> 
researchers will absolutely hate me for just saying this, like stating a hypothesis just out of the blue. But like, I feel like a lot of the reasons that autistic people tend to not have good like research outcomes, like with um, independence and you know, social relationships and such is that we spend so much of our energy just surviving Mm -hmm. and it it's blocking us, even as children from developing the skills that we would need to thrive. And I think about this a lot because I teach children Mm -hmm. and I find so often Adults prioritize the wrong things where the message that children's are children are inundated by is you, you have to be independent. You have to be independent. Mm-hmm. And if you fall short of that, yeah. you are going to feel terrible about yourself. And, and oh, absolutely. No, one, no one is fully independent and yeah. with literal thinkers like that's a terrible way to set them up for yeah. mental health challenges instead yeah we should be cultivating interdependence, how to ask for help and support and Mm. advocate for your needs. And all humans are interdependent. None of us, no person anywhere on earth is independent. It does not exist. And so we have to fight that mentality, which is everywhere. It's so pervasive. mm -hmm. Like we're a social species. We are built to work together to accomplish a better goal for all of us combined. We are an interdependent species and that's a good thing. (laughs) That's what's made civilization be what it is. (laughs) You know, Um, no, I, I, I definitely see it a lot as well. I had, I had earlier this year, a couple of parents ask me, and I'm not kidding. How do I make my child mask because they aren't doing it? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And it was things like, well, they have meltdowns when they come home and it's, it's really, you know, uncomfortable for everyone else. And it's like, well, I I get that it's uncomfortable for you. And and I definitely would want to help you have that not happen quite so often. But you know who it's most uncomfortable for? I think you might be looking at the wrong. (laughs) I think you might be looking at the wrong problem here because I think your child is probably having meltdowns because they're very stressed and because their needs aren't being met. And maybe we can look at some of the causes of those meltdowns instead of trying to teach them not to express their discomfort and their pain. (laughs) Anyway, we're we're talking a lot about, (laughs) we're talking a lot about like kind of the precursors and, and like what's in the way of autistic joy. So let's try to focus a little bit on autistic joy and autistic victories. Well, I think like we have a victory right off the bat. You and I Mm -hmm. decided earlier this year we were going to start a podcast. And, you know, we we bounced ideas back and forth. We created a Google Doc and we did it. We did it. We got it done despite all of our executive function nightmares in in putting it (laughs) together, in scheduling, in editing, recording, (laughs) We've done it. We've done something. We did. We did. And we actually managed to get guests for a lot of episodes as well, which wanted to be on it. (laughs) Yeah. I I thought that was so amazing. You know, I've been, um, I've been astounded sometimes at our ability to, to coordinate and make it happen despite like time zone differences and scheduling differences and like, It's not always been easy to find times to record this. We've done it. But it's been so much fun. And I I have enjoyed it tremendously, all of these conversations with you. And like, it's been fun, you know, it's been, despite being like added work, obviously, like editing things, it, it has brought me joy. It has brought me a lot of joy to do this with you. (laughs) Same. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Oh, sentimental. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I also think there's um, there's tremendous joy for me in autistic friendships. It's um, it's a completely different connection than what I have with 
I don't want to say all neurotypicals because I do have, I do have one neurotypical friend yeah. that, that I feel don't get it. Don't get really it. closely connected to and, and where I can like fully be myself. Yeah which is amazing. But most of the friendships where I can be authentic and where I feel that genuine connection, those are the autistic friendships. Mm -hmm. And there's so much joy to be found in that and finding, finding people who think like you. Yeah. (laughs) And, And it's a weird thing because like, I think we had, specifically the two of us, I think we had like one or two conversations before we were like, kind of both decided by ourselves, okay, we're friends. Yeah, we like dropped the mask completely by yes. like our first condo. <laughs> our first conversation, we were, we were both super professional because you very had contacted cool. me about a student and we were like really going through very professionally okay so what can we do to help this student la 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 and then like one or two conversations later it was like no no, no we're just gonna we're just gonna <laughs> chat this it's is true. fun <laughs> and I loved like just like throughout our, our friendship we've established you know uh, our own norms where it's like no you never have to apologize if you need to cancel a zoom meeting that we've established yeah. like I understand if you don't have the spoons the energy and vice yeah. versa and we've been uh, very very good at those things <laughs> and there's there's such a relief in finding that yeah yeah and, um, and I think if I could do one thing for like all of my clients and for all of the autistic people um, that I ever meet, I I would want them to find a friendship like that. I would want them to find, you know, one other, one other person that they could just, and where, where they're just accepted Um, and, and find that, that relief and that joy in having that and not constantly having to think, I'm wrong somehow, or yes. um, does this person actually like me, or are they just pretending? No, they're not pretending. They're autistic. If they didn't like you, they would just say it. <laughs> and this is why I think like spaces <laughs> like autistic Twitter are so important. And I'm praying, I am praying that nothing oh, happens on Twitter. You know, the um, irony of Twitter being taken over by an autistic person, <laughs> and then. And then <laughs> Uh, yeah. oh gosh no but we've gotten you know each other through a whole bunch this year we've both had like personal and professional roller coasters and mm-hmm. so I'm I'm extremely grateful for your friendship and then we in our last you know private little get together we were talking about how our our childhood and adolescent versions of ourselves would not believe would not believe the friendships that we have mm-hmm. um and that, or where uh, we've gotten to in life. Yeah, yeah. The, um, like the boundaries that we've overcome. And there's still stuff that's hard, but. Yeah, yeah of course. Of course. Life is best, not easy. Yeah, the best part about diagnosis is like you have an understanding about why things are hard. And, and it's, it's not mm. like internalized to the same degree as it was before diagnosis. Mm. I mean, I haven't perfectly mastered the art of self-forgiveness and self-compassion, but I'm getting there, (laughs) you know. And our executive functions are always going to be a little wonky. (laughs) But, you know, know, I'm very happy to have people in my life who are kind of like my surrogate executive functions. (laughs) And it's it's strange, isn't it? Because even though we're we're both challenged in that way, I feel like sometimes um, we're actually able to like, be executive function surrogates for each other. Yes, I, I do the things that you don't like to do, <laughs> vice versa, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, um, yeah, I don't know. It kind of, it's just a thing. Well, even for this, you you are always so good at structuring the conversation, keeping time, all the things I can't do. And I'm a timekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I routinely need people to remind me, like, it, you know, it's two minutes till the break, like in all of my jobs too, you know? <laughs> okay. So um, autistic victories that we hear about out in the world that, 
that don't have that connotation of like um a patronizing tone to it do you have any oh gosh uh i i feel like i should return the question to you first here an example <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you have in mind <laughs> Well, I don't know, because I feel like it's always a little, a little bit of both. So a little bit inspiration um, corny, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that always comes to mind for me is, is Temple Grandin. Mm -hmm. um, because she's such an icon in the autism world. Mm -hmm. And even like her story has been turned into a biopic, you know, and I, I feel like a lot of people genuinely see her as someone who not necessarily just despite her autism, but like has actually turned her autism into a strength and has done something with it. Um, and I do appreciate when I hear those, mm -hmm. those perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, but I also feel like sometimes there is that, oh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of despite the autism. And well, I feel the same way with, uh, with Greta Thunberg. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, that it's, it's kind of like, oh, she, she did something kind of cool with it. no matter if you agree with her um with her positions I happen to but even if you don't you can't deny that she's accomplished something and she has followed her passions and you know mm -hmm. done things that we know would be very challenging for an autistic person to do but she does it because of her conviction mm -hmm. um, and passion so yeah. she's developing things, abilities that would probably have been hard for her that she might not have pursued had she mm. not had the conviction she has. Yeah. Which is and pretty. I mean, that's the kind of conviction that you get from an autistic special interest. Yes. Um, which, I mean, yes, we can talk about them as as obsessions as well. But, um, but it is something that gives you a lot of drive and pushes you towards accomplishing something. And I, I feel like those stories, and, and it's weird because autism is still such a, such a male diagnosis in so many ways. But when I think of autistic celebrities, a lot of them are female. That's a really good point. And um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. No, I mean, I try with my students, I show, well, I show, show a wide range of representations mm -hmm. and, and I do, I do try to show autistics in different types of professions or with different mm -hmm. talents. There, there's a great video about a man who creates like a maze throughout his house for his cats to run like through the oh, yeah. and things like that. So I show that cause it's like, it's so inventive and creative and you know, it's it not is. a job per se, but it's like that. It, that's a fulfilling life for him. Yeah, it's it's something really cool. Really cool. And and so I think we have to again not not repeat the mistakes of the media of mm -hmm. just showcasing people who are like Nobel Prize nominees and you know, like because we're not all gonna be that. Very no. few of us are going to no, be and, and quite frankly, the two of us aren't. No, you know. No. <laughs> Never. I uh, I know that it's I know that it's kind of weird because why would I put myself out there if I feel this way? But I actually see myself as very mediocre. Like I don't, I don't have any special skills. I don't. You're very I'm special not, to me. But <laughs> thank you. No, but I'm, I'm serious though. I, I don't know have, you. I don't have um, any like God-given talents, and I'm not particularly smart. Like I'm, I'm of average intelligence, and like. I the things that I've accomplished I've accomplished because I'm stubborn yes like I've done it because I'm stubborn as all hell I think that's and occasionally occasionally but some luck as well like I'm I'm lucky that my psychologist happened to be who she was and happened to introduce me to Tony Atwood who you know that's a huge 
a huge chunk of luck right there. Um, but it's stubbornness that made me like do my education. It's stubbornness that drove me to study yeah. social behavior so much. It's yeah. stubbornness that, that was like, no, I'm going to go and I'm, I'm going to, um, like engage in, in live action role-playing despite yeah. it being so stressful for me. Yeah. That's where I found all my friends, but I, I only found them because I went and I did the thing, even though it was hard. Yeah. And, and so I feel like that stubbornness as negative as it can be sometimes, because it also drives me to exhaustion. It's also been the thing that got me through. Yes. And I, you know what, you've just made me think of another point I want to go back to. So when we're showing representations Mm -hmm. of autistic individuals, I think it's an important part of the conversation is not just, oh, they're so successful. They met, they met societal benchmarks. It should also be like, what were the barriers? How do we Mm -hmm. remove the barriers for ourselves, for other people? Like, what do you relate to? What is hard for you? Like, we have to talk about challenge. Um, Mm -hmm. we have to also show videos of autistic people saying, guess what? It's really hard for me to leave the house. Sometimes here are some strategies I use to make things more bearable. Um, like we, we have to have a little bit of inspiration, but not at the expense of like Mm -hmm. denying also what is hard. We had a decent program in Denmark some years back. Um, I honestly can't fully remember the title anymore but it was like um it was like the hidden talents or something like that um and it was about like I think it was like four autistic people that had different talents um one of them I don't I don't know if she has savant syndrome I think maybe she does um but she had like most I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, Denmark is very behind though. Like yeah. we still have not adopted the new ICD diagnostic system. Like it's, it's, it's madness. Like it should have been here. It should have been here this year at the latest, but yeah. it's not. Um, but yeah, she had this thing with like number recognition. So you could write up like something like 16 numbers and just show them to her for two or three seconds. And she would remember all of them and their positions as well. Um, And, and what this program did was actually, it showed these, I, again, I think it was four autistic people um, and kind of their quest for finding a job they could fit into And that could accommodate their needs because, yeah, she's a savant in this particular way or she has this particular talent. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's really good at at like pattern recognition. Great. But there are so many other ways where she is more interdependent and does need that support. And how do you accommodate that in a workplace in order to actually have that successful autistic, you know, employee, (laughs) which again, it's, it's not an autistic thing that your needs need to be met in the workplace in order for you to do your job well, but our needs are just different. And um, yeah, I I thought this program did it really well because it didn't feel like inspiration porn. Well, and I I really hate the narrative, too, that, like, we have to be useful to be valuable. And sometimes that's where the conversation goes when we talk about Mm -hmm. employment. And um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I I think autistic fulfillment looks very different. It does. But what I liked about this was that it was not just about how can she fit into a workplace. It was also how can the workplace accommodate to her? Yes. What can we do for the environment? And and give her the environment that she would need in order to work. Yes. Because no, we can't just necessarily go and work in a normal environment. Like I, I could never go and have 
you know, um, in, in Denmark, it's usually eight to four or nine to five, like it, it can be either or. Um, but in the public sphere, it's very often eight to four. I can never go and have a full time job in the public sphere as a psychologist because the work environment that is there is not suited to my needs. Yeah. I know that because I have friends that work there and they can tell me what it's like. <laughs> and I know that I just I would I would break down from that. I would yeah. not be able to do it. But I'm able to work you know the amount that I can under these other circumstances that I've built for myself. And that's actually one of my autistic victories for this year. Hi. Is that I am now moving towards um, kind of making some small changes to my working situation so that it will be more sustainable for me. Oh, that's wonderful. Yay. I, <laughs> um, I suppose I have two. So again, micro and macro. So macro is I have a new book deal with Jessica Kingsley Publishers. Yay. For a book centered on classroom um, neurodiversity and supporting all the needs and normalizing the idea there is no normal and talking to everyone in the room about what's hard for their brains, what's easy for their brains, and what supports that they need. Because I think we can get rid of stigma if we if we talk about this across humanity, you know, not just talking Absolutely. about the, 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 the students with diagnoses mm -hmm. needing something different. Yeah. We all need something different. So yes. that's the nutshell. Now I've got to get writing. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But uh, you can do it. <laughs> it will, it will get that. <laughs> um, and then I think micro level, I've been really trying to work at decreasing my crushing existential dread that I bring up quite frequently on this podcast. And one thing that I did, I recently, I, I created a little, a little joy menu to become more intentional about mm -hmm. allowing myself. Cause I think it's, I have not always given myself permission to relax because I always feel like there's so much to do that mm -hmm. I don't, I don't relax. I don't enjoy moments, even if I try taking them. So I've tried to stop that and just say, you know, you are allowed to do several things from this list and truly enjoy them. Yeah. But then it's spilling over even into to little things like my drive to work instead mm -hmm. of, of thinking, oh, it's, it's a 20 minute drive. Oh, I'm going to be stressed in the traffic. I put on my favorite tunes, usually Ella Fitzgerald, you know, yeah. a lot of jazz. And I'm focused on, I'm really enjoying the, this 20 minutes where I get to listen to this and yeah. start my day off right and end my day, you know, give myself some energy at the end of the day on my way home. You know, it's a fun psychological phenomenon that when we, when we force ourselves to focus on joyful things, it, it gets contagious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, like our whole mindset can start to change. Yeah. And for some people, it really doesn't take that long. For others, it takes a little bit longer, but it works. And sometimes it feels stupid. Like I have, I have this thing that sometimes uh, with clients who are kind of like a little bit depressed, but not, you know, really, really terrible. Like there are, there are more things to do there. But the ones where I feel like it might actually make a difference, I talk about like making um, making a joy journal. Mm. So like every day, and I, I start very slow. I'm like, you know, just write down however many things that, that you have the energy for. But I'm going to say at least one thing every day. Yeah. And if you forget one day, that's completely fine. You know, every day that you remember is great, but the, the target is every day, just write down one thing that made you smile today. Something that was pretty, something that was fun, something that was nice, something that was maybe a positive surprise or something that was a relief, anything. Mm -hmm. And I'll give them examples like it could be seeing a pretty flower or it can be, oh, it's not raining today, yes. <laughs> you know, or it can be, I had some food that I liked. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. And if you are having a really bad day, it can be like, 
I made myself brush my teeth and that was a victory. Yes, exactly. I got out of bed today briefly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And sometimes that's enough. Yeah. But just that shift in focus, I see it kind of getting contagious over time. And it's like, yeah, it feels stupid in the beginning to write down that one to three things every day. Um, But eventually it's like, no, it's actually quite nice. And it helps to sort of shift the mental set point because we can get really stuck in. Well, I mean, we strengthen our neural pathways, whatever we think over and over Mm. again. So if we're thinking of all the, um, the, the reasons our life is terrible, Mm -hmm. the negativity bias becomes even more pronounced. Yeah, it does. It does. And, and it is actually a physical thing that happens in the brain. It's, um, um, you know, the, the neural pathways kind of get coated with this fat sheath called myelin Mm -hmm. and it just makes that neural pathway, the, the signal move faster in that direction than if it has to go off somewhere else Mm -hmm. and by forcing ourselves to think differently we actually force our brains to create that myelin sheath on other neural pathways and the neural pathways that we don't use can actually lose that myelin sheath so we can we can actually, over time, prune our brains. <laughs> yes. It's like, I call it brain hacking. I love it. Like, I love it. We're, we're going we're gonna to hack our brains towards specific neurotransmitters and stuff. Yeah. You talked about I, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I find it so fun. Um, it, it, it's included in, in the energy counting book when, when we f- <clears throat> get it finished. We're getting there. You are getting there. We are getting there. It's um, it's going to be great. It will be. be great. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually kind of moves into kind of the, the questions for this episode, which I thought we could talk a little bit about what our plans are for the next year ah, yes, and yes. how we are embracing our joy. Okay. I love that. Um, well, our plans for this podcast or our plans? No, as I mean, just as just as people, because we have time to talk about our plans for the podcast afterwards. All right. Well, it sounds like we're both yeah. writing books. <laughs> so. We are. <laughs> that is a, a little bit further than you are with this one, but I, I mean, you only just got the book deal. Yeah, I've got a few subheadings in a document. That's about it. <laughs> but we'll get there. Yeah. Um, uh, this will actually, so in 2023, this this episode is coming out in, uh, in 2023, uh, but we're a few days before January that, 2nd. So we are still in uh, 2022. This summer will be the first summer where I have not, where I, as far as I know, we'll see if things change, but I am not working a second job in the summer. So I get my summer break, my teacher's <gasps> break. I've never in 12 yeah. years of teaching had a summer break. Um, wow. So hopefully, hopefully I'll do something. Hopefully I'll do a little bit of traveling. I don't know. Come to Denmark. I should come to Denmark. Oh my gosh. Can yes. we live up ep- well, an episode together in person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, Denmark is great in the summer. Is it? Okay. I'll keep oh, going. Yeah. I'll start saving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people will donate to us and fly us like <laughs> For an in-person episode. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, that'd be great. <laughs> what are you planning to do over the next year? Well, like I said, I am making some changes to how I'm working. So up until now, I've actually had two offices. I have had my, my home office here. And then I've had another office in Copenhagen. And I'm actually quitting my office in Copenhagen. Wow. Yes. And you would think that it was because of the travel time, but it's not because I actually like the travel time is, is a lot sure, but it's doable. Mm. Um, with, with walking time, it's about an hour and a half each way. Um, and a good chunk of that is just sitting on the train and 
listening to music, you know, I'm good. But the thing is, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast, but I have pretty shitty feet. Um, They decided to break in my mid twenties and not as in a literal break, but kind of just, they stopped working. Um, Something happened. It's a longer explanation. Just, I have shitty feet. Um, And the thing with this office is it's on the third floor and it's the wonkiest stairs on the planet. Like they are, they are nuts to walk on. I can't. And usually I'll go there twice a week. And what I've realized is that when I go there for those two days, my feet hurt for several days afterwards. And that recovery time means I then can't do other things that I enjoy. Yeah. So I decided that I shouldn't have an office that's not properly accessible to me um, in a physical way, because it is autistically accessible, but it's just not, you know, physical for me. So I'm quitting that office. Yeah. um, And... I I may be getting a second office in town um, so so that I have that option of having clients that are not in my home, but uh-huh. we'll see. Um, but I'm making those changes. And then I plan on finishing my book, finally. <laughs> I, feel like it, I feel like it should have been done like years ago because it's... We need to avoid the word should. <laughs> yes, I know, I know, but it's... I've been working on this book for like 10 years. <laughs> it's stupid. Yeah. Um, it just keeps growing. You know, the project just keeps growing. That's and, the hard part. <laughs> and, and now it's like, no, it, it has to be done. It has to come out and then I can make changes and I can do a second edition at some point yes. if I need to. Sometimes being now, done is better than being great, but it is going to be great. So it, it is going. You've seen it. So I, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> it's. um. Yeah, so we're going to finish it and put it out there. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. And then, yeah, just, I don't know. I'm just making little changes to focus on my well-being. And we've talked about on this podcast how we're both kind of people pleasers. Yes. (laughs) And... I'm at a point now in my life where it's like, yes, I I want people to be happy with me. I want to do things for other people. I want to help people. I want to all of these things, but I need to take care of me. Incredible. That's really good progress. (laughs) It is. The psychologist finally took her own advice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, but it feels so good to, to actually you know, I'm starting to set boundaries with people in my life. Oh, that's so good. And be like, you know what? Yeah. My well-being matters. Yeah. I love as that. As much as everybody else's. Mm-hmm. And uh, that it's taken a while to get there. People will I'm always gonna... make demands on you. And like, yeah, you, you are responsible for keeping them at bay sometimes. Exactly. Um, and that's, yeah. That's, that's where we're at now. I started, I started a, a coaching business. I have, well, I have one client, but I know yeah. coaching, um, an autistic team and I'm really enjoying that. Uh, and, um, I started dating someone new recently and on our first date, I told them I'm autistic and I like, I've never done that on, I, usually wait, like, I wait like way too long, like, I wait like months, yeah. but I feel very I'm proud funny. of you for that. I feel very much myself and accepted for myself and we'll see where it goes, but so far so good. (laughs) No, but I I feel like there's a victory in coming to the place where you're like, no, I'm going to tell people right off the bat. But I also have to, because they know my first name. (laughs) I don't, I don't go with like on dating profiles and have my whole name, but like they know my first name. They know I live in the city of Toronto and they know I, I work in the autism field. You Google those three things. (laughs) What like comes up? <laughs> Every yeah. Time. So, but no, but also um, I wanted to, right? Like it wasn't just a, <laughs> because 
that's an easy find, but I felt safe enough to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So that's it's a victory. Awesome. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to seeing what will happen. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So next year on this podcast. Okay. So we have not coordinated Ooh. enough to have a date for. We when don't have a plan. Month. We don't have a plan. We have no. ideas. We have. Yeah a mishmash of topics we might like to cover and ideas for, you know, different lived experiences of autism we'd like on the show. Like I would love to figure out how to have a non-speaker on. Um, that would be great. That is really important to me. Like um, I, I think we definitely need to have an intersectional approach to the work that we do. Um, and, you know, because we have one set of challenges, but, mm-hmm. you know, there are autistic people have other. You have have other significant barriers that you and I don't have. Mm -hmm. I would like to get um, even, you know, even more guests that represent the wide diversity that is our wonderful community. I agree. So topics that I've thought about um, and that definitely include people that we haven't had on. um, I would like, to talk to someone about synesthesia. Oh, I love it. Um, And you mentioned wanting to do an episode about alexithymia. Yes, because I I think that is something that I have where I I have to cognitively process my emotions. I'm not always intuitively aware of what I'm feeling and I wanna Mm. learn so much more about that. Yeah. And for those who don't know, synesthesia is when you kind of, you get a sensory input in in one sensory modality, um, but it gets processed as a different one. So for example, people who um, hear colors or see sound. Or um, get a taste in their mouth when they hear a word. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and, and there's all kinds of different forms of, of synesthesia. So I'd love, I'd love to talk about that as well. Um, and we also talked about wanting to do kind of a, a, a double episode. Yes. Oh, I'm this one. I'm it started a bit as a joke because we, we, we were watching something together and I started, you and I started doing like voiceover as if we were David Attenborough narrating <laughs> neurotypicals in the wild. Right. Yes. <laughs> And so we thought it would be cool to have an episode where we have one episode where it's autistic perspectives and we ask questions about what is friendship like for you? How is it to start a friendship, maintain a friendship? How do you know when a friendship has run its course? Like questions like that. And then we do the same questions with like a neurotypical or two neurotypicals and just be prepared. Like I know you and I will have some jaw dropping moments where we go, that's what it's like. (laughs) That's what it's like yeah. for you. But I think I think I'm preparing myself to have the experience that neurotypicals will have a difficult time explaining it. Oh, because I don't think they right. think about it. They do not overthink and think as like as much as we do no. potentially. <laughs> we I think it would be really interesting for sure. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. obviously, it's going to be more of an interview format. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Do let us know if you think that would be interesting to, to have from us. Um, other topics that I really wanted to cover was I wanted to do an episode about ADHD and ADD and kind of the overlap with autism, mm-hmm. but also because because sometimes they have similar symptoms, mm-hmm. but sometimes they're also just complete opposites and it's really hard to get the two to work together and, and you never so know what you're going to get day to day. yeah there yeah. are so many people with both yeah. and it's um it's definitely an interesting combination up to 80 percent of us yeah yeah that many yes up to 80 percent 60 to 80 percent are oh. the numbers i've seen yeah i didn't i didn't see those numbers yeah wow there's a lot of us who yeah well, I, I don't have access to research journals anymore, so it's, <laughs> damn it. Um, okay, another topic that I really wanted to cover um, is pathological demand avoidance. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's a tricky one 
because there's so much to it. I mean, it's tricky and it's not tricky. Like to me, the simple part is anything that feels like a perceived loss of autonomy Mm -hmm. triggers an extreme anxiety response that can look many different ways. But yeah. So like having control of one's own life, having, you know, says and decisions like that is, Mm -hmm. that is what we have to provide. Yeah. That sense of safety that comes with that. Yeah. But then also here's my thing is when you then grow up and you become an adult and you still have pathological demand avoidance as a part of your personality profile. Yeah. Yeah. How do you live in a world where you have actual responsibilities that you cannot put away Yes, when you are, you know, demand avoidant and, and demands mm-hmm. actually cause you to be anxious? Yes. How do you live with that? How do um, you? And not to say that you can't, it's more so like, what are the strategies? How can yeah. we talk about it? It's, um, yeah. I, I, I would think that would be really interesting. I love that. I, I I think I would learn a lot from that. And these are just like some of the things that we've talked about. There are so, so many more. And like some yeah. of the topics that we discuss as, as potential topics for this podcast are very lighthearted and fun. And some of them are super heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, and many of them, like when we reach out to guests, or people reach out to us, uh, you know, we, we let the guests take the lead too. What, what are they passionate mm-hmm. about talking about? What, yeah. what, what do they want to bring to our community? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is it for season one of autistic tidbits and tangents. Happy 2023. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we will post on social media as soon as we have plans for season two and we will let you all know and if you have any ideas for us anything you want to bring to the table do feel free to contact us we are on social media as Maya Todale and Kara Diamond Dr. Um, Kara Diamond (laughs) Dr. Kara Diamond and um several places you can also find me by searching for an autistic psychologist Mm -hmm. Um, so do reach out because we're here and we do welcome your ideas. So let us know. And we really hope you enjoyed our first season and it's been so much fun. It has. And and we hope that you are doing things for your own self-care to foster joy and fulfillment. However, that looks for all of you. So I guess celebrate your victories in life. The small you know, ones and the big ones. Even, even if they don't look like the victories that society tells you you should have. Yeah. There's still Celebr- victories for you. And those are valid. Celebrate them. Throw those norms out the window. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. We don't need them. <laughs> we, we create our own. Well, I guess that's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. It is. Happy 2023. Woo! I'm